Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to the latest in this series from the International Sleep Charity on our global webinar um, program. And tonight, for your delectation, we've got something very different. We have a young ex-recently graduated student, um, Shafi Ali, who's going to talk to us uh, based on his own experiences and his learnings about bedroom lighting. So um, there will be uh, a question and answer session at the end. So please, um, could you just post through any questions that you've got? And I will put them to Shafi for you. And without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to the main man himself. So uh, Shafi, warm welcome and over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. Um, yeah, no, uh, thanks for inviting me. And yeah, it'll be great to walk you through my project and um, give an overview of uh, kind of my background and also um, what I've been doing in the lighting space. Uh, I've got some slides. I'll just share my screen. Right. Can you see a big title that says bedroom lighting of the future? Brilliant. Um, yes. Yeah, so background wise. So as Charlie said, so I went to Imperial and did a design engineering degree, which I recently graduated from. Um, and that was great. It was four years essentially doing projects which aim to solve problems using uh, design thinking as well as technical engineering and from programming, electronics, um, mechanical. Personally, I'm more mechanically orientated, but I like doing all the, all the different kinds of uh, areas within engineering. Uh, I've had previous experience at some startups as well as at Dyson. So I was working in lighting and professional. Um, and there I was working on future projects. Uh, what you can see in the corner is the uh, Morph, which is one of the products which uh, I didn't work on it directly, but I helped with some of the testing later on. Um, and then the Dyson Zone wearable purifier, which is essentially headphones with a intake. And then it's got a uh, essentially a uh, unit at the front, which drives air to essentially create like a purified bubble. Um, and I helped develop the filter presence detection mechanism for that. Um, hopefully that will be launched later in the year. But yeah, that was um, interesting uh, to work on. But during both of them, I was working in lighting, learning a lot with uh, photometry and kind of the import importance of light in, in our daily routines. Because I think out of all the different health verticals, it's one of the hardest to crack because it's not the most obvious to cause problems in our life. We kind of just accept it how it is. Um, Although I'm 23 now, I've seen lighting technology shift over the past 10 years. I recall when I was um, 13, 14, seeing how in one of my family, uh, uh, where my family was staying, there was basically just all 6,000 Kelvin white lights. And that was the, that was the whole duration of the day they'd be um, on. And then when you go to bed, you switch them off. But right before bed, those are the ones that are on. It's not ideal. And now you've got affordable lighting solutions, um, smart lighting solutions. Um, but what I want to talk about today is a project I did in my fourth year module, Sensing in the Internet of Things. And essentially, we had freedom to create whatever we wanted as long as we captured data for a week, uh, logged it, and then built actuations based on the data. So you could monitor moisture in soil and make an automatic watering unit. Or in my instance, I recorded my sleep and light data to understand circadian rhythms and then try to improve them as well as a uh, second part. So essentially I was working on two instances. So lighting in the bedroom is important because it not only affects our mental well-being, but our physical well-being, because essentially sleep is where you get your rest and recovery. Um, artificial lighting has negatively impacted that. And you know you can use smart bulbs to turn on and off at certain times, but there's very few. I think Philips Hue have kind of done it now, but there's very few that truly sync based on changing sunrise and sunset times to reflect the natural cycle of the sun. Um, low cost smart bulbs don't really do that. High cost ones, if you're going to change all the bulbs in your house, you ideally don't want to be spending lots and lots of money. And let's say if you're a student, not ideal. Um, so. That was the first aspect I wanted to tackle. The second one, which is less related to sleep, but I thought it'd be interesting to mention is uh, emotion-based lighting. So at the moment, lighting is, emotion-based lighting is you set it manually and you want to um, 
determine I'd like to be in this mood, but this was turning it on its head and seeing how can we make it more meaningful? What if my light could reflect the mood I'm currently in? So essentially the aims of those projects were to, for the circadian rhythms was to understand how misaligned my sleep pattern was from the natural cycle of the sun and what actuations I can make to encourage my cycle to shift and then form it into a habit. Uh, Because ideally you want it to be something that you don't even think about. Um, And then for emotion-based lighting, how can we visualize emotions in a more intuitive way? As I said, um, instead of us setting it on an app, what if the lights told us how we were feeling? So with circadian rhythms, what are they? So there are 24 hour cycles in our body, which are highly influenced by light exposure. Uh, These have always been dictated by the sun because we didn't use to have light uh, as an artificial light. but that has had a negative effect because it puts us out of sync from the sun. And essentially I want to see how bad mine was Um, because with university, I think everyone can relate. They've uh, had difficult uh, sleeping schedules. And if you did, you're very fortunate. If you didn't, you're very fortunate. Um, But personally, I struggle with it quite a lot. So I wanted to understand how could I um, determine that misalignment. So, The first thing I did was track my indoor bedroom environment. So I used a Raspberry Pi 3 and a color luminance sensor to track the Lux light levels, as well as the RGB colors. So the actual color temperature in my room. And that was converted using a color science module. Then I was tracking temperature and humidity uh, because these are relevant to sleep, but they weren't core to the project. It was mainly just additional sensor information. Um, But the key one being the light sensor uh, wirelessly logging uh, into a database. Next, I approximated the outdoor light. So the outdoor ideal color temperature, I essentially based it off of the local sunrise and sunset times and the solar elevation at those times. So I kind of said, this is a major simplification of how it works, but it was a way to kind of say, this is what it should be. So at midday, ideally it's 6,000 Kelvin and you get towards the night, it's zero Kelvin, but it's quite a big shift because between sunset and night, kind of at sunset time, you're looking at kind of 2,700 Kelvin. You're looking at quite a warm temperature. Um, So it essentially interpolates between those to create a, um, you know, what what is the color temperature of the sun approximately? Um, Ideally, I would have a temperature, uh, a color temperature sensor uh, outside to do exactly how my environment was uh, where I was living. However, I lived in a kind of, ground level flat or the ones in London which go beneath the ground so my windows weren't really ideally positioned for that Um, but this did a pretty good job at um, determining it and what's important is that this value changes because the sunrise and sunset times shift every so little uh, during the month um, which is why we have stuff like daylight saving hours. Um, The last bit to kind of bring it all together was tracking my sleep state which is why this all matters so I did this with a Fitbit And essentially, uh, this is kind of, you can see the poor sleep values there, but I wanted to see the different phases of sleep and then also when I was sleeping. Um, And this was all uploaded live with sleep data. It's very difficult to do it kind of with a battery powered device and continuously log because it drains the battery too quickly. So the way that Fitbits usually work is they log, uh, locally on the device and then they upload to the phone at the end of the day um, or whenever you next sync it. So that's essentially what I did. As soon as I woke up in the morning, I would just um, uh, have do my normal morning routine. But then when I open my phone next, it would sync um, and that would transfer the data and upload it to a, a database for me to use. So given that, I made actuations. So I wanted to understand the uh, data. So I made a web app. And then I use sun color synced bulbs and sunset synced blinds, but more on that later. So the first thing was to visualize the data. So this page that I made allows me to see my sleep state and the lighting conditions in my room versus the ideal ones outdoors uh, by hovering over the graph. So that's that bottom left figure. Uh, You can also see the raw data plots and the correlation tools. And there's also a live feed um, page. And I can share this link afterwards um, because this is, yeah, live. Uh, but based off historic data, I'm no longer recording it because I kind of don't want that data online. (laughs) Um, So essentially what I found was my sleep cycle is pretty poor with 
my sleep having a negative correlation with the natural cycle of the sun. So that plot on the right that you see is a Pearson uh, correlation coefficient matrix. So what that essentially means, I'll point to it. Um, I think, can you guys see my mouse or no? Not Is currently, mouse... Shafi. Ah, okay, that's okay. Um, I will, let's take this. Okay, so I think that shows up now. Uh, yeah, pointer. Well. Okay, great. Um, so essentially, uh, this shows how correlated the outdoor color temperature is with my indoor bedroom lighting. Ideally, this should be one, which means I am perfectly synced with what the sun should be. But as you can see, based on this um, uh, legend on the on the right, that it's going towards the negative numbers. So it's slightly negatively correlated, meaning when it's um, bright outside, I would start to go to bed. And when it's uh, dark outside, I would be awake. Uh, but it's only slightly negatively correlated at minus 0.3. Um, again, this is looking at color temperature outside and my sleep state, which is slightly orange. Uh, but then you, we can confirm that it's kind of matching because uh, the color temperature outside compared with the color temperature of my bedroom is also negative. So you can kind of see that there is that misalignment, which is not ideal. Uh, but what was key here is that this helped me to visualize and understand. Um, let's turn this off. Okay, great. Um, so essentially I found my sleep was broken. So what did I do to help me improve this? So I used sun synced bulbs. Um, so it's not just a case of turning them uh, from one color to another at any random point, they were synced towards what the sunrise and sunset times and they changed over time. So if you try and change it constantly, this is where a sampling rate really matters. If you're trying to change it constantly, if they're cheap bulbs, they can sometimes flicker. So these were changing every 20 minutes. So it wasn't constant and distracting, but a gradual shift that you wouldn't really notice and you would just kind of settle into it. These features are now getting better built into existing devices, but on low cost devices, they're not so well um, implemented. Um, so this was the first thing that I did. Uh, it changes from cool to warm. The next thing were actuations uh, in terms of my blinds. So my blinds I made, um, let's, here we go. <laughs> okay. Um, so essentially what this was is trying to provide flexibility because obviously you have artificial lighting, but you also have uh, natural lighting. So the idea here was to be able to control both that entered my room. Uh, and the Alexa implementation is because I sometimes don't want it to just be the sunrise and sunset times. Let's say I've just had a shower, I'm gonna close the blinds, but if it's only synced to the sunrise and sunset times, you know, that's quite limiting. So that's why I added that um, uh, smart home flexibility uh, so that I could control it manually as well. Now, what I looked at more meaningfully through all of this wasn't just the actuations because although the actuations were good and they were better encouraging me to sleep, I didn't want them to force me to sleep, but that's kind of part of the issue because since the lights were still on, I was still active and awake. And because I had work that kept getting pushed and pushed later into the night, it also kept me awake. So what I think actually would help is to have those sunset control blinds without the manual control and then have my lights switch off at those times. But obviously sometimes priorities of what you have to do in your day to day don't match with your sleep, but that's something that I'm learning over time, uh, how to make those two work uh, together better, because in the long run, it'll be very important, um, as I said, for health, both physical and mental. Um, but what helped me to visualize it the most was taking the data and overlaying it over each other, because these graphs on their own don't really mean much to me. But looking at this, 
you can see that the sinusoidal type plot, so the red plot, is what the natural cycle of the sun is. And then you can see that the uh, uh, purple is what's in my bedroom. And you can see that when it's bright outside, it's dark in my room. And the green plot is when I'm asleep. So when it's dark in my room, I'm asleep, kind of makes sense. There are instances when I leave my room, so here, so it's dark, but I'm still awake. That's because I've left my bedroom. Um, this was kind of during when we were leaving COVID. So a lot of it was work from home, um, which made this project more interesting to do because you got that data more easily and more accurately um, compared to if I was leaving. Um, but it kind of demonstrates to me that, okay, there is this huge misalignment, I need to improve it. Um, and kind of that happened more naturally um, as a result. So this was a short-term project. It only lasted approximately two months, something like that. Um, so it was a lot of work to get it all together and then to also record the data over the course of um, over a week, a um, little over a week actually, and then be able to have things that reflect what's going on. So that's part one of the project for bedroom lighting of the future. Part two is emotion-based lighting. So this is looking at, you know, how can we use RGB bulbs in a more meaningful way? Because I often see RGB bulbs slightly gimmicky. I think the best use case I've seen of them is using, uh, using them to approximate um, color temperature values as opposed to having um, the you can essentially get a phosphor coating over the LED, which is kind of the proper way to do um, color temperature accurately. So warm, um, uh, warmer color temperatures, but you can also kind of mix RGB values to approximate that. Um, but again, I often see it as like you synchronize it to lights and it's, it's, not, it's not ideal. So I wanted to look at it from a different perspective. So the first thing I did was do face data capture. Um, and I used OpenCV and my PC webcam to get a high frame rate and use something called a Haar Cascade Classifier. So this essentially draws a box around my face by identifying line and edge features. And then it crops it down into this tiny uh, 48 by 48 pixel image, which is making it in the same format as the data set that I was comparing it to um, and that the model, uh, machine learning model is trained on. So I used um, an existing model that I found online, which had 27,000 faces. So huge, um, uh, huge uh, amount of faces to work with, but it couldn't pick up subtle subtleties in my expression. So I had to sometimes over-exaggerate in order for it to detect, detect the emotion. So then I used my own images in order to get subtle detection of uh, how I was um, uh, feeling based on the way my face was. So, once I did that, it could pick up a slight smile. Now, the only issue with it was I don't really take many pictures in other emotions other than neutral or happy. So it couldn't classify the other areas, which was um, uh, sad, surprised, uh, and angry. Um, so I went back to the existing model, but I think a personalized model with all of those features would be ideal um, and getting enough images for them. So I made a web app and real-time color changing bulbs. So for the emotion data, uh, emotion data logging, I looked at um, essentially recording over an 11-hour 11, 11 work period, um, which is essentially when I made the visualization tools based off some sample data for this. Um, and what you can see is that most of the time I'm neutral. And then <laughs> there were two instances where um, you can see here uh, where the value for sad increases. I can promise you I was not sad. It's just that the existing model seemed to think when I focus, I look sad. But um, uh, that happened only twice during the thing. Most of it was neutral. Um, what's interesting is because it's classification, all of them will follow a similar um, increase. It's the one that has the highest value that the classifier will go, this is what it is. The better trained your model is, the lower these other peaks will be and the better it will be at selecting it. But usually what happens is that all of them will increase by like 0.1 or 0.2, but the one that it believes is the most accurate will be the highest value. So like 0. Point, in this case, I believe it was 0. 0.4 or just below 0. 0.4. Um, but uh, yeah, so carrying on, um, the next element was taking the 
uh, information and having the bulbs change. So here you can see it working in real time uh, to reflect the emotions. Um, and that's kind of lighting is now truly emotional because it's actually based on my emotion. Um, overall, uh, the project had multiple outcomes, but it showed me that my sleeping pattern wasn't good and improving it is extremely important to avoid future health complications. And it's key to engage with, um, you know, building good habits for sleep and routine. I think routine is one of the most important elements uh, for it, as well as managing the devices you use at night, as well as um, lighting. In this instance, having your lights go from um, cool to warm. And it doesn't have to be smart. You could do it manually. But the thing is with smart is that it no longer becomes something you even have to think about. So the visualization is what allowed me to understand that because essentially I could see that misalignment and it contextualized the data way more than just looking at, oh, I got five hours sleep. Oh, I got eight hours sleep. That's great. But doing it at the right time is also important. And I believe that's something that could be improved with future sleeping and health apps. Um, now, again, this is a prototype setup and I think that it can go further into real world and whether that's as an open source project or um, pre-built into something, um, I think having that available at low cost to make it accessible for more people is very, very important. It shouldn't just be the highest end bulbs that do this. Um, and then for the actuations, again, it's great that the color temperature changes, but switching them off is also important, but that's gonna be something that's also built through habit. Um, and then for emotion-based lighting, I think it demonstrates an alternative use case for RGB lighting, but it also aids in potential nonverbal communication in future, where if someone struggles to understand emotion, then you know if someone displays an emotion and the lights change, it can help people build that understanding. So let's say for children. Um, but overall, that's uh, that's the project I did at university. Thank you. Wow, that's uh, that's fantastic, Shifei. Thanks so much for that. <clears throat> How many how many hours did you spend on this uh, this project in total? Well, judging by the amount of sleep that I lost, um, a lot. <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think it was it's kind of ironic because I did it in a pursuit to fix my original problem, but in in effect, I also exacerbated the problem. But at good at a good cost, I believe, because that now helps me, and now I've I've definitely improved i'm now getting much better sleep and at the required times and i think this really helped me to um achieve that uh, the, the project overall took around i believe two to three months something like that and it was just essentially constantly developing and having a direction at the start and i kind of already knew that i wanted to tackle this area i was just finding finding a module that i could use as an excuse to do it so um yeah thankfully the degree lets you tackle any any major problems um, that you believe are worth solving. So this is one of them that I wanted to have a go at. Shafia, I, I was really impressed with how you'd taken a very real problem and, and found some data to put behind it as a way of analyzing it. Um, so on the bedroom lighting, you were saying about the bulb cost. You know, there are already um, bedroom lights, you know, Lumio do one, I bought some from China. Um, you know, what, what do you think your cost solution is? Cost solution? As so a, what, what would it cost, you know, your experiment, what, what would it typically cost to, to run? Well, it really, the Raspberry Pi itself, to be able to get that data capture is only something like 40 pounds with the sensors, 40 to 50 pounds. Mm -hmm. um, the sleep tracking again you can get any low cost sleep tracker it's just about interfacing with it so again that's another 30 to 40 pounds so if you wanted to be able to measure those yourself and then put them into um, like graph it out and then have it presented it could easily be done for sub 100 pounds um, i think having the actuation of the light bulbs however it really depends on which ones you buy because at the moment light bulbs are so fragmented in the market where each one has its own ecosystem. And then what you notice with the low cost ones 
is that they overcompensate with features that you just don't need in order to have a healthy sleep schedule. Um, and then you notice that like on the Philips side, you have fewer features, which is ironic because you'd expect it the other way around. But I guess an example is like Apple, right? Apple don't give you every single feature because it's not premium to, to do that. It's not necessarily beneficial. So I would say the lowest cost way to do it is for the sensors to measure sub 100 pounds and then the bulbs it really depends on what you have but those bulbs that i bought only cost me 50 pounds so 10 pounds for for each bulb something like that um but i think it is it is achievable to do it and not too much cost it's all about it's all about personalizing the uh the experience isn't it or mm -hmm. it's really how it trend how wellness is trending in general i wonder if the uh the audience has any questions for um Ashipay. I, I've got more questions. So Chef, at the start you were saying that your sleep was really bad and you you showed some data. Typically it was a shortened sleep at irregular times. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um value is always a question of, of benefit over, over cost. Okay, so where where's your sleep at now? You know, if you use this system, you could go from being what kind of a sleeper to what kind of a sleeper in your experience or intuition. So I think the sleep that I was getting originally would be something like going to bed at two or three or four a.m. It, it kept getting pushed back and back and back and then waking up with five or so hours of sleep, which is not ideal. I mean, there is research in theory, which there's research always on both sides, which supports some people need less sleep than others and some people need more mm -hmm. sleep than others. But um, let's say seven hours is ideal. Um, then I would say the original was based on the environment that I was in. And I think it's also a part of the way my brain was active because it was trying to solve this problem. But I guess creating habits and sticking to it was was key. So now where I am, is getting at least seven hours of sleep uh, and sleeping at, let's say, 11 p.m., uh, uh, sometimes earlier, by 10 p.m., sometimes later, 1 a.m., depending on what I'm doing. Uh, but the key is having habit and routine and, and sticking to it because humans are creatures of habit uh, is what I've learned. And, yeah, I think being able to see it made me see, okay, actually, my sleep's kind of messed up. Um, so that that was the benefit. It was just being able to okay. understand it. Thank you. Thank you. What do you think are some of the uh, most exciting uh, uh, innovations in this space? Um, space apart from you know your own work, because I think there is some combination of sleep coaching, the sort of apps out there smart alarm clocks these types of things but what do you see is really on the horizon and say you know, five to years time as the uh, areas that folks should be looking at five years time or ten years time yes yeah, five to ten years time that's okay it. five to ten but, years. yeah well future scoping is always a difficult one because no one ever gets it right and those who do get it right because they were lucky um but if i were to determine what i would think is a good way for things to move forward is the concept of ubiquitous computing. So the idea that we don't serve technology, but technology serves us. So it actually helps complement our life and leads to a seamless user experience. So what I see is that all the different kind of smart home devices that we have are interchangeable and the app interface that you use for them, you can select the one that works best for you. Because again, um, I think you, you said it as well, it's personalization, everyone has different needs. And it's about accommodating those. Um, one thing that I've seen, which is a great move in the smart home space, is uh, something called Matter. And Matter is essentially, um, it's a standard which companies are now following, some of the biggest companies in the world are following, uh, to essentially make their devices work with each other because they recognize that it is so fragmented that it's hard to be able to, you know, if I want to buy another bulb and one of them's out of stock, I can't buy another brand. But if you can buy another brand and fit it into your, um, smart home experience, then, you know, that means we don't have to think about, you know, my app A is synced to my app B. I think having that seamless experience is going to be key. And I believe in the next five to 10 years, it will have those 
rough edges ironed out because you would think it's a simple problem to solve, but it really isn't. It's it's taken a while for people to recognize and then act on it. So yeah, that's what I hope to see really uh, mature by then. That resonates a lot, and so certainly in in healthcare, say interoperability is a real Achilles heel that still no one's really solved. I'm sure it's, it's better outside of the uh, the world of healthcare per se. And any thoughts about the Web3 and the metaverse in, in sleep? Um, should I? Yeah. Um, I think it's problematic because as a young kid, your you know, parents would always say, don't sit too close to the TV screen. And now we're stuck them right in front of our eyes. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how we interact and how that affects our circadian rhythms in the next five to 10 years. Because like, for example, social media and devices in general, we just kind of launch them. We have no idea what the effects will be in the long term because, you know, stuff like apps, they rely on exposing uh, dopamine hits in your brain and doing that very short term again and again and again. Now, if you keep using that for several years, maybe it'll do nothing. Maybe it'll mean that we can't stick around to read a book because we're, we just need five seconds or seven second content. Um, so I think going forward, it will be important to make sure that sure advanced stuff like, um, the metaverse, which is essentially, um, digital alternative worlds, right. Um, which have existed for ages if you've played video games, right. Um, but it's maturing that space, but also maturing it alongside, uh, health and well-being. So for example, you know, blue light filters on phone. Uh, on the phone is an improvement, but that wasn't there for at least 10 years. Uh, and it was only in- implemented once we were like, oh yeah, this is kind of bad for our sleep. So I think we'll see a similar shift. I don't think we know what the problems are yet. I think we can guess what they are and try and design for them, uh, which is important, but we only really know until it becomes a problem, um, which is unfortunate. But yeah, I think the best thing we can do is map out what we believe it is and target those problems which we anticipate to be the biggest um but yeah i think with devices in general management of them and management with how we engage with them is important i think for me metaverse has a lot of benefits in the work environment um because for example metaquest pro is designed for people working collaboratively uh, whereas Meta Quest 2 is designed for gamers. So it will it will happen if these big companies want it to. But yeah, it'll be about managing managing it well with health and well-being and how, how long we spend in them. Yeah, there's a, a lot of hype in the space, isn't there? But also it's something that one feels perhaps can't be ignored, as you say. Um, it's existed to some extent uh, for you know, almost decades and the idea certainly is nothing new however there really feels that there is some kind of convergence um, at the moment and yeah it's really interesting to think how in say 10 years time the world will look because I mean certainly I think this idea of ubiquitous computing I mean, even I'm going to get time scale slightly wrong, but I mean, I, I don't think maybe say 30, 30, 40 years ago, people would quite have expected to have interacted with uh, computing in such a way that we do now. Um, I mean, in Back to the Future, we, we all thought we'd have hoverboards and flying cars. So, um, yeah, it's it's interesting to see. Uh, but then at the same time, no one would expect that we'd have ultra powerful computers in our pockets. So, um, but the thing is, I don't think we realize the magnitude of it because we're we're living in it but yeah it'll be it'll be interesting to see what we think the future will be and then what it'll actually be but i guess it's up to you know designers and engineers to help direct that um absolutely it's a it's a fascinating space it's so interesting and very exciting well thank you so much uh for this really i mean it's been truly enlightening I don't think there are any further questions from the, the audience or the panelists. So I think we'll probably draw it to a close. Um, if, yeah. if there are any further questions, just feel free to message me on LinkedIn or anything like that. Um, because yeah, I'm always passionate to talk about um, this space and yeah, tech in general. But, um, yeah, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure speaking.
No, no, no. Thank you so much for doing this. Really appreciate it so much. And um, we'll wrap up and there then. But um, as, as um, Chavez kindly said, it's very uh, approachable. And we'll be happy to answer any follow-up questions over LinkedIn. I'm sure we'll keep in touch. And on behalf of everyone uh, from the International Steve Charity and uh, everyone that's attended today, uh, thank you so much. And we hope to uh, host uh, another global webinar series soon.